LLMs are changing the way that entry-level work is being done across the entire corporate world. What do you do when someone approaches you with a project that is a little bit ambiguous in terms of like ethics or it's just like in sort of a gray area? I, Gleeb and I both actually use the same term although we actually heard it in different areas which is kind of interesting which is like would you feel comfortable in your project ending up on the front page of the New York Times? I'm interested in what maybe the the craziest or most interesting project you've ever done. Yeah, so that was like that like that first time in my life where I felt that this data that I'm looking at is actually a little footprint of the entire human society. Having the right tool for the job is just so incredibly powerful. And so it's like some of these projects end up being just so quick. So it's like, oh yeah, you, you helped your friends with a project, but if you expand the scope of that, you literally have a product that could be useful to, to quite a few people. I guess this is a business idea. I'm just kind of floating out there in ether. Yeah, so if anyone does this, we want at least like <laughs> three or 4%. A cut. Um. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> This episode of Ken's Nearest Neighbors is powered by Z by HP, HP's high compute workstation grade Atlanta products and solutions. Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing Gleeb Dropkov and Mike DeZuby. They're the founders of Charles River Data, a Boston-based data science consulting firm. Gleeb is a returning guest, and you can hear all about his experience as a data science consultant at BCG in episode 23. Since that episode, he has taken the leap to leave BCG and found CRD with Mike. Mike is new to the show and has a great wealth of experience working as an engineer and data scientist at Google for over seven years before starting CRD. In this episode, Mike and Glebe go deep into how they started their business, why now is a great time for consulting and contracting, and the biggest difference between running your own shop and working at a Google or a BCG or one of these big companies. I really enjoyed this conversation and I know you will too. Stay tuned. Gleeb, Mike, welcome to the Ken's Nearest Neighbors podcast. Happy you could join me today. Good to be here. Glad to be back. Thanks for having us. For those tuning in, I've had Gleeb on the podcast. His episode is, I think, either the most watched on YouTube or one of the most watched on YouTube about his experience in data science consulting. Mike is a good friend and now business partner of Gleeb. And you guys just went off on your own to start a new data science consulting company. So I'm really excited to, one, dive into a little bit more about your stories, but also figure out what it means to go off on your own, how you get your first client, how you start growing a business, uh, maybe some of the fun things that that happen along the way. So again, welcome, and I'm super excited about, uh, about the opportunity to interview here. Happy to chat about anything. This will be great. Thank you. Amazing. Well, so I, I'd first like to ask, how did the two of you meet? And then how did that lead into the two of you working together? I think that's something bridging that gap of being like, oh, I actually, I'm friends with this person, but I also want to work with this person is, uh, is one that's a little bit hard to, to cross for a lot of people. So Mike and I actually met in our freshman year at Cornell University. I uh, see that's a painting by my grandmother over there in the corner. But uh, we were really close friends. He was a computer science major. Um, uh, oper operations research, actually, with a computer science focus. And I was in uh, the economics track. And we just knew each other socially. And then even when we graduated from Cornell and started jobs, uh, Mike was at Google, and I was at Capgemini Consulting uh, for my first job. We always uh, stayed in touch. And Mike actually introduced me to my now wife. Uh, we had a very close friend group in New York uh, that would do supper clubs or dinner dinner together. And we always nerded out about data things. I and mean, we were doing different parts of the data science world. Mike was more on the, uh, the, the heavy engineering and, and at Google. I was more on the business impact um, and consulting. And we always had this itch, this idea that maybe one day, once we acquire some knowledge, we can start our own company. And uh, it's definitely an exciting journey and a ride. And uh, it's so fun to work with one of your closest friends and a groomsman at my wedding. Um, and, uh, just happy to be working every day. It doesn't feel like work when you're working with your friends, not to say, make it really trite like that, but it honestly is like that. How cliche. Um, but Mike, why don't pass it over to you to kind of how you, uh, decided to embark on this journey after your, um, start of your career. Yeah. Um, so definitely echo the last piece. It is very fun 
to work with your friends. It's actually the biggest challenge is to actually stay focused at work as opposed to just shooting the shit with your friends. Um, but then again, that's a big benefit of working with them. Um, so we've kind of always had an interest in starting uh, his own consulting firm. And I think, you know, as he kind of went through, he mentioned he worked at Capgemini, but as he went through Capgemini to JP Morgan to BCG, I think he always had that entrepreneurship bug. Um, I was, you know, kind of deep in tech at Google and was there for almost eight years by the time I left. So I was there for quite a while. And I actually did not have the strong desire to go off on my own. Like, I think it may sound surprising now because we run a company together, but I did not have this entrepreneurship bug. I was like, well, I don't know, you know, I'm kind of enjoying things as they were. But what happened was when the pandemic hit, right, everything got shaken up, you know, people were working from home permanently. I was still at uh, Google. I was at their healthcare division, very early life sciences at the time. Um, I was working from home, but when you start to pull away all of the like, you know, coffee breaks, the lunches, like the schmoozing with people you work with, like when you pull away all that fun part, what you really have left, and especially at during the pandemic when like we weren't going out very often, um, what you're left with is a lot of like just the pure work. And the question is like, how passionate are you about the pure work you're doing? And that started to fade. You know, I'd also been there nearly eight years. So it was kind of becoming time. And so eventually I decided to quit Google um, or technically just quit Alphabet. Uh, and I actually did not have a plan. I was not like thinking I'm quitting to go found a company. I was thinking like, I'm quitting and I'm going to, you know, plan to take some time off, see where life takes me. And that involved a year of woodworking. <laughs> uh, so I got super deep into it. Um, I built most of the furniture in my house. I got into welding. Um, it was treehouse. I, I, yeah, I watched way too much treehouse masters and I eventually ended up building a physical <laughs> treehouse attached to my house. Um, but like one where I involved like an architect and a structural engineer and like made it two stories. Like it, it's quite the tree house. Um, so I built all that and then, you know, I was happy, but eventually I got kind of the itch to be like, I need to like put my brain back to work, you know, like as much as I love all this stuff and I love building stuff physically, like I, I kind of want to get more involved in like mental challenges. And so that led me to start doing academic research at Mass General Hospital and uh, Brigham and Women's, which are kind of together now. Actually, I mean, they're formally together as Mass General Brigham. Um, I just figured, you know what, let me get involved there. Let me do some data science collaboration, get involved with publications. At this point, it was like improving the outcomes of surgery and helping uh, reduce, helping research and reduce opioid usage. Um, and it was really fun. We were doing, you know, tons of data science with them. I was enjoying it. And then eventually, and I realize this is a bit long winded, but I swear it's getting there. <laughs> um, and then eventually a project came up of detecting uh, liver cancer using 3D machine learning through CT scans. And it sounded like a cool project, but it was like a ton of work. And so I was like, I was volunteering all my time and I was like, well, I don't think I can do this for free because it's like 200 hours or so. And they're like, oh, we have a grant, we can pay you. And I was like, that's interesting. So I just kind of work when I want to work and I just log hours, you just pay me. And it's kind of funny, I know like many people work in this way, but it's my first time kind of doing that after like full-time position. And so I was like, yeah, I'll try that. And it was great. I mean, I chose a project that I was specifically interested in. Um, I worked when I want, and I found just like an incredible amount of like impact and meaning in doing it, right? It was an important project because otherwise they wouldn't have funded through a grant. They would have gone through a process of getting that money and spending in this fashion. And then, you know, Gleam and I started talking. I mean, as Glee mentioned, we've been friends for a while now. I guess that's since college, which is around... 2008 was when yeah, we met. Yeah, 15 years ago. Um, and so I had realized I'd fallen into a consulting position. Um, and then it really started to kind of like become real once I chat with another friend of mine. Um, her name's Courtney. Uh, she runs a private equity firm. And she's like... We have all sales data. It's, you know, becoming a ton of data. It's a bit overwhelming. Can you help us make sense of it? I'm like, yeah, that sounds like fun. But, you know, it's a lot of work. Like, I don't think I can, you know, as a friend, I, I'm sure I could do like five 
10 hours for free, but it was like 100. And she's like, oh, no, we can pay you. And so that was probably the first real consulting project I had. And then Gleeve and I started talking and like, we were like, oh, this is actually kind of consulting. I have now become a consultant after leaving Google. And he always had the strong penchant to build a firm. And what happened though was at the time, um, you know, he was uh, soon to have a baby, soon to become a dad. And um, so didn't exactly have a time to immediately jump ship from BCAG and join. But, you know, just as a friend, he helped give me advice at the time. And so that started to grow. My contract started to grow. The man started to grow. And then eventually it had grown enough. Uh, Gleave has a very healthy daughter right now. Um, and the time came for him to, to jump ship and join. So eventually we essentially like kind of, I built it, you know, essentially independently, but then he came and that was just so much more powerful, you know, because my background is always in tech. Figuring out how to write the contracts, how to structure that is challenging and um, was not my forte. And so when Gleeve joined full time and we suddenly had someone with such like a deep business background and so much experience in this area come in, our skills are just so complementary that it's just so much stronger of a company now and growing so much faster. Uh, so we're going from like, you know, kind of a little bit of a baby company to like, let's say a teenage company to now like a fully formed mature company. Um, so long way to answer, but that is how we ended up working together. Um, and it's, it's been great. I think the key thing is we have incredibly, probably two things. One is we have incredibly complementary skills. So it's not like we're both super in tech or both super in business. It's like, you know, as a Venn diagram, we have a nice overlap, but then also we communicate very well and are very open to accepting like kind of criticism and pushes because we're both constantly learning, right? He's learning more about like some of my, my tech expertise from Google and how it applies. And I'm learning a lot more about the business realm and how that applies. And so that's what really allows us to grow so strongly together. So I definitely want to dive into how Glebe, you decided to make that transition from like a full-time highly stable job into the consulting area. But before we do that, Mike, I do want to understand a little bit more about like, what are the key differences between working at a company, like a big tech company like Google, and then transitioning into essentially like more contract or consulting work? I think that that's probably a big gap to bridge, probably more so for you than, for example, for Glebe, who's been consulting for the last almost 10 years, probably more than that, right? Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering what like the, the bottlenecks were for you or like what the biggest struggle adapting to that work might have been. Yeah. So it actually is surprisingly different. Um, like, I guess I thought it would be similar, you know, like I was doing software engineering and data science at Google. I was like, oh, I'll just do that for other clients. But things are very different, right? At Google, there's a lot of like, things move a lot slower but they're also designed to constantly scale and constantly um, be open to just massive growth. So if you want to build a small feature for something, you would actually think about like, okay, we have a thousand users now, but I need to design it in such a way that it might have 10,000 or 100,000 or a million later. And so even at the beginning, you have to design that way, which means the build process is very long. Right. Even small features take incredibly long amounts of time. And this makes sense at Google, right, because you want things to be able to ship to the whole world very literally. But, you know, sometimes that can get a little bit frustrating, right, because it takes so long to get an MVP out um, or the fact that, like, maybe things pivot and the project gets killed before it gets launched. Uh, obviously, this, does, this doesn't always happen, but that can happen at Google. And it's very different at consulting firm because instead we come into a client and we're like, we understand their needs. I mean, you know, lots of conversation, figuring out their needs are coming to terms on what they are. And then it's like, okay, how fast can we make an MVP? Can we do it in two weeks, three weeks? Can we do it before we even sign this deal to give them a sense of what's to come? And like that pace was very different and I liked it, but there was this kind of weird thing where like at Google, it, I just got so inculcated in that everything needs to be designed to scale. You know, the level of quality of all of our reviews, like, you know, I was 
taught to essentially like comment on people's comments in code. So if you had a typo or a grammatical error, like that should be fixed before it can submit this code. Like if you say a word and it's slightly ambiguous in your comment, that should be fixed before it can commit this code. And so the standards were incredibly high, but that's because like there was some code I wrote that's like executed 10 billion times a day, like as part of Google search engine and it's executed on every single search and instant search and autocomplete and all of that. And so it actually took a while for me to kind of transition to like, how do we still have the same high standards, but move faster? Like, how do we actually realize that like, okay, if this is design only works for, you know, a thousand customers, like maybe that's a fine place to start. And maybe we want to fully finish this and then we'll come back, you know, if it's incredibly successful and then redevelop it for a hundred thousand or a million, if that's what the client needs. But spending all the time in the beginning to develop it for a million customers is not the right way to consult. So I would say that was actually surprisingly the biggest challenge for me because I just did not expect it to come up as a challenge at all. I was like, yeah, we'll just build something faster. It's fine. But then I realized, no, it's really this like balance. Um, but I ended up growing to love it. Like I love the fact that we can build MVPs and like throw stuff together super fast um, and just see it live super fast. Yeah, I, I would imagine it's also a little bit freeing. I know at large tech companies, there's a lot of infrastructure that's already built, right? You're expected to use certain tools because that's what everything else is built in and it's supposed to be integrated in a specific way. I, is it for, for both of you guys like a little bit overwhelming on the other side of that where it's like, oh, for every project, we can choose whatever stack we want. Um, you probably have a preference and you probably do specific things in a certain way fairly routinely, but you know, like deciding your own stack of what you use for a lot of projects, I would imagine actually is like a pretty interesting endeavor because you got to like essentially build that for yourself rather have it rather than have it pushed upon you uh, from an organization perspective. What you're saying, Ken, is, is one of the major, I think, differentiators for a small agile company versus a large one that has... Uh, uh, all these this bloatware on your machines that that kind of slow slow down your development process. At, at JP Morgan, they had their own version of Python. Like this is this is so complicated when you have to relearn everything, and it's a deprecated version. And new packages don't work. But I digress. Um, Mike, what were you going to say? It's true. I mean, this, the story is the same, just with a different flavor at at Google. Like at Google. You know, we had to be super specific about what libraries we use based on the licenses they had, because not every open source license that is, you know, freely open source means you can use it as part of a bundled product. And then if you do, you have to ensure, you know, it's properly cited and credited. And how do you confirm that when you release a Google Maps deployment, it has that. So there's just a lot of overhead in that. And that's fine. But I have like a specific memory where like we want to use we were doing a ton of data transformations and we want to use dbt which is a great simple language simple product for just building these whole kind of sql flows and pipelines in nice clean ways and we're at belly and we want to do this we're like oh this product is absolutely loud based on this license we can totally use it and the answer is like oh no it's going to go through this long process to get checked into like a whole repo we should probably just build something from scratch i was like what and so I, I kid you not, the software engineer just re-implemented like so many of the DBT features from scratch. And it took him like, you know, like a couple months to do this. And the reason is because we just weren't quite able to use it. I think they might have had one thing. Maybe they had one thing in their license that didn't allow us to use it in the way we wanted. Um, and so we spent like two months building this out. And then we used what this person had built, which is fine. He was very strong, but it's just like such a time sink, right? Whereas like, as Glee pointed out, this is what makes us nimble as a consulting firm. Like we're like, yeah, we're just gonna use UBT. Or like, uh, he used a lot of Airflow in the past, Glee did, and so we're like, oh yeah, we we'll just use Airflow. Like we have libraries that work really well for the problem at hand, and because we can just choose whatever is best for the problem at hand for our client, we can move super fast. We just don't have to re-implement the wheel at all. You know, it's it's really kind of, fantastic to be honest it's like it, it, it's much more freeing like at google it was cool and i think it also has to do with the point in time we are and here's why like one thing google had was massive scale like if i want to make a database with like 
uh, 10 billion rows. I could, I could just set it up. I actually made a mistake once and messed up some code and like flew through my quota on their internal drives, which I then learned my quota was like 28 terabytes. Um, I didn't know that until I made, I forgot an if statement and output too much data. But the, the point is like in the past, that is something you could only get the big companies. But now you have Amazon Cloud, you have Google Cloud, you have Azure. Like, Believe it or not, right now for a client, have a database set up, which has, I mean, over, we have a couple uh, that are over a billion rows and like, just not a problem, you know, like BigQuery and like Postgres at scale can like handle just all pay this. pay monthly. Yeah. yeah, it's just like, you want to query like 600 million rows at once? Okay, yeah, no problem. It'll take like 15 seconds. Like, no, not hours. It'll take 15 seconds to these massive transformations on it. And because we can do that externally, we get the best of every world. We can choose whatever libraries we want, but we also have like access to these clouds that can scale with us. So it's it, it's very fun. I mean, it was cool learning all the things that Google does, and it can be super fun sometimes to learn like the absolute in and outs of building a product from scratch over months. But uh, you know, once you're outside, it, it's kind of free. This episode of Cat Zero's Neighbors is brought to you by Z by HP, HP's high compute, workstation grade, lot of products and solutions. Z is specifically made for high-performance data science solutions, and I personally use the ZBook Studio and the Z8 Workstation. I really love that the Z Workstations can come standard with Linux or WSL2, and they can be configured with the Data Science Software Stack Manager. With the Software Stack Manager, you can get right to the work of doing data science on day one without the overhead of having to completely reconfigure your new machine. Now back to our show. It's very interesting to think about building or buying from the perspective of a company that is at the scale of Google, because one, it's like, oh, the critical path to get this through legal and the like the risk of using someone else's product if it changes or whatever it might be kind of hard to change if there's versions. But uh, but still, like that path might be longer than just executing and building it yourself. And you have more control. And there's a lot of these things where like most off the product stuff is uh, off the shelf is pretty good and it works for 99% of use cases, but the 1% of use cases, like the 1% use case is at Google or at Amazon or at Microsoft or at Meta or something along those lines. Right. Yeah. I mean, Meta has done the same thing where they build all their own infrastructure internally, even though it exists externally because they want to have control. They, they believe that gives them a competitive advantage. It also is interesting for like employer retention like I know quite a few data scientists at Facebook where they basically worked, you, they did all their data science with Facebook's internal tools. And when you go into the open market again, you're actually, you know, like it's weird to it's see, to not use the tools you're used to, right? Um, totally. But I, I think that's probably a conversation for another time. I do want to dive Glebe into your decision to, uh, to essentially leave uh, a role that I know that, that you enjoyed and that that you you had a lot of career success in to do this full time, uh, especially, you know, after having a child, it, there's a lot of perceived risk about leaving a large corporation to move into a more traditional uh, into a less traditional uh, consulting venture. Uh, walk me through your process there. Yeah, absolutely. So I ha I will caveat and start by saying that BCG uh, will always have a very special place in my heart. I had an incredible experience there and I learned a lot um, as uh, my three years as a senior data scientist and two years as a lead. What I noticed at the five year mark of my time there was that the company's uh, structure kind of requires you to spend some time to make it up to the top where you can be a decision maker and drive impact and change in the way that we delivered work. And I felt that kind of, I was not always able to do that um, directly because I, at the end of the day, I'm a, um, a very effective kind of execution engine. And I, I'm, I'm, I do what the partner team uh, decides on in consensus in meetings. I have a moment to, to disagree with it, but once we move forward, I would always execute. So I felt that I could potentially um, learn more by exploring the side where I take the risk and see the results. And that's exactly kind of what this opportunity with Mike uh, presents, because uh, we 
we pay we pay well, but our pay is very much performance based. Um, we have a blog post which outlines this on our blog. Um, maybe we can link it at the end of this uh, in in YouTube so people can follow it, follow us on Medium, and uh, and listen to our founder story. But the goal is to I, I took a pay cut, and I'm very happy because what the goal is is in the long run we can generate something which is uh, better for our health and for our uh, clients, and they'll get better results because we're really, really motivated and very experienced people. And at BCG, I was having a great um, kind of learning trajectory, and I picked up a lot of new uh, technologies and, and types of use cases. I learned how to deliver them. Uh, but I did feel that if I stayed for another five years, it would be a lot of a repeat and kind of focusing in on, on, a, on a few uh, things to grow. And I felt that um, the kind of the value of doing that on our own where there's more risk, I think, but more reward was uh, was a better better move. So, I if if things work out, I'd love to partner and collaborate with them again one day. Um, but the, the the reality is that uh, we have a really nimble, agile operation, and we can move fast. And I think we can do some really good work. So I was excited about that, and that's why I jumped. That's amazing. I, you know, I I think that uh, something really stood out in what you said was that you weren't necessarily able to be as much of a decision maker there as you would have liked. And I I had a a really interesting conversation a couple of weeks ago with my friend, uh, Greg, who I just had on the podcast. And he talked about how one of the most important decisions or the conversations he ever had was with one of his bosses who told him, you know, Greg, as a data scientist, most of the time you're just advising on the decisions. You're not actually making them yourselves. And I think that that's, for a lot of us, kind of an eye-opening thing is that, oh, like, yeah, we're not actually making the decisions. Maybe if you deploy a model or you you put something into production that actually is an engine for making decisions, that's a little different. But there's something very powerful about having uh, control over the outcomes rather than just inputs into what they are. And, you know, and as, as consultants, you're still in that bubble a little bit where you are a little beholden to the client, but you still have complete autonomy over what clients you take on, how much time you spend on the clients, the, the the way you approach those projects, which is inherently fundamentally different than from when you're working for a, a larger company. And I, I actually think that there's a, a massive trend towards contracting or doing consulting work because of this. You know, a lot of people would say, oh, Gleep, you know, you leaving this great job with, I'm sure, good health insurance and all these things is a huge risk for you, yep. right? I actually believe it's almost the the opposite. So if, you know, for example, you know, God forbid you got laid off from there, you start from ground zero, maybe you have some investments and stuff like that, maybe you get some severance, but you have to start the job application process all over again. You know, that's a pain in the ass. Like there's a lot of overhead associated with that. On the other hand, if you're doing contracting or you're a consultant, you can have multiple clients at the same time. You're flexible with the yeah. skills you have to be able to work on new projects and work on some of the latest things, which is not necessarily common, even at the most cutting edge tech companies, just because the um, like type of work or the specific teams, there's so much overhead to, to be involved in them. And so I actually view the work you guys are doing as in some ways significantly de-risked because you can diversify and you can adapt so much more quickly than what a traditional job role would be. And, uh, you know, to me, that that's something that very few people are talking about. And I really love that you guys are, are sort of embodying that, uh, that the nature of that with this new venture. I would echo that. It's, it's really nice to have a diversified kind of set of sponsors. Uh, that's a kind of a, or client partners versus in, in the consulting world, you kind of have that. You start working with different pyramids. So an MDP, a managing director, might have a group of people that he works with. But if he doesn't have work at a moment or she doesn't have work, then they would go work with another MDP for a short period of time. At CRD, we, uh, we just have two decision makers uh, and, our, and our other co-founder, um, Trevor Burgess, who is a, a CEO of Neptune Flood. And we, can, we, we, we have less of the kind of analysis paralysis. We can move and make decisions and, and work with different clients. And we never feel like it's uh, if, if you're stuck on something, you're you're working on it for a long time. And it's not moving anywhere. And consulting people, if you look at fishbowl, people are always saying, 
I really want to roll off my case and I can't. It's really kind of, I'm stuck here. There's this, it feels like you're always in this kind of negotiation about what you can and can't do. And having freedom releases you from having to kind of be beholden to other people who might not always have your best interests in mind. Yeah. You know, something we talked about offline, I'd love for you guys to, to comment on is that you guys actually benefited from a lot of the, the, I guess, like the downturn in the big tech space with all the firings and a lot of those things. Can you talk about, you know, your guys's, uh, how you fit into that overarching, like employment puzzle? I think there are probably two so- two ways in which we benefited. One is from the influx of available talent, but also one is, you know, it's kind of funny, like companies started doing cost cutting, right? In terms of people, in terms of projects. But sometimes what also happens is like, they don't necessarily cut uh, consultants because it depends what the consultants are focusing on. If they're like, oh, we have this whole team of full-time people working on this project. Um, Maybe we don't need that many people on it. Let's instead just farm it out to consultants. It creates more work, right? Right. For, for, For consultants. So not every like companies are not simply turning down and say, oh, we don't have any projects because of cost cutting measures. Like, fortunately, that's not how it plays out. I think to some extent it does for some kind of specific styles of consulting. But for us, because we tend to focus on stuff that has very strong positive ROI, like we just take on projects where it's like, okay, we can see exactly what we could do here. And we expect, you know, your revenue to increase by this much. We'll reduce this essentially manual kind of task and do an automated piece an example being for, um, you know, Neptune Flood, our biggest client, like they, you know, have to manually read thousands of insurance claims and they're incredibly long, like 100 pages, 100,000 pieces of paper to read, right? Instead, automating that using machine learning and LMs, like saves them a ton of time. So it's just kind of an example of like something they wouldn't cut, even if they were doing cost cutting measures. They're not, they're actually, you know, they're doing very well, but it's one of the things that saves times either way. So it's kind of in terms of the projects. In terms of the people, it was kind of interesting. There were, you know, there were mass layoffs, but also the kind of change in morale at some of these companies like at Google. And I do want to say, I did have a great time at Google. I know we mentioned this about BCG. And I do want to say it too. You know, even though we're talking about things and I'm voicing some complaints here and there, overall, great experience. If I wasn't there before, I wouldn't have learned the skills to run a company with Gleam now. Um, but one thing that happened is certainly a lot of people got laid off and suddenly were working for work. Additionally, a lot of people kind of weren't happy with how many people got laid up, laid off and all the shakeups and the reorgs. And so they just quit. And so what we started to find is that there were a collection of people that were just very well skilled, very strong, that were both looking for full time work, but also many who were like, you know what, I want to do 20 hours a week. Like, I'm down to do that. I'm down to do it regularly, but I just don't feel like doing 40. And they would come to us. This is just people from our network. And we'd be like, yeah, you know, not a problem. Like, we're a small startup. We can easily take on 20 hours of work a week, give it out to you. And then this just adds this kind of flex pool of people, um, a a term we started, which I really like, um, that that can grow with us. So, like, as we get new projects, those people that were doing 20 hours are sometimes interested in jumping up to 40 or turning into full-time employees. So we benefit both kind of from projects that opened up and from the people. So, uh, you know, I, I guess it's called, you know, the mass resignation or that was kind of almost before this and then you had the layoffs, but in the end, it's just this mass shakeup. And I think as the dust starts to settle, people are settling into like positions that tend to work just better for whatever they were looking for. Um, obviously that's, not always true. Sometimes it's hard to find new positions because tech isn't hiring as much as it used to. But I think shakeups can be good in general, even if it takes some time to settle properly. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting. I was doing a lot of research on, you know, contracting and consulting and those types of things for some other projects I've been working on. And there's a pretty aggressive uh, trend towards big tech companies hiring significantly more consultants and contractors. And I don't think that that's going away anytime soon, especially based on the nature of um, one, the economy, but also the nature of the entire field of data science and technology. 
I think that we're entering this age where we're companies are going to be outsourcing significantly more than they ever have before, even core data science responsibilities. I mean, think about what OpenAI is doing, what Google or DeepMind is doing with Bard. They're trying to make essentially a single um, a, a single API that you can outsource almost anything to, any type of project that you can build on and a lot of these things. And the idea that you can have a something that is generalizable, but also can specialize to specific use cases is the same idea technology wise versus human capital wise is like if you're hiring a consultant, wow, I can get this person that has the exact skill set that we need for this specific thing, rather than trying to hire one person when uh, they're going to be working on something that doesn't that's only a portion of their skill set or a portion yeah. of their time allocation, right? It's really inefficient to hire someone. It's like, oh, we need them to do this specific thing, but like, are they going to do other stuff too? Because all of their time isn't going to be spent on this specific thing and they're wasting and squandering their skill set. They're probably not going to be happy doing some of these other things. It's, it's like a very interesting overarching trend that I'm seeing. And it, it's, it's really interesting to see how, how CRD and all of these types of things fit into it. Uh, production flood, we're doing a large linear programming and quadratic optimization problem, right? This is like a very specialized part of mathematics. And like, we have people that do this type of work, um, myself included, it was kind of my major. And so when they have a problem like this, we can say, yeah, we have the people, let's apply them. But it wouldn't make sense for like them to hire a dedicated person to do optimization because they just don't have enough work in that specific field. So it makes sense why people kind of hire out these specialties in consulting, because sometimes you just don't have, you know, full-time work in that area and specialists are expensive. It can even be true with ML engineers and people that focus on AI. Like, do you really have the amount of work and, you know, the budget to hire a full-time ML engineer? Um, maybe, maybe not. But if you bring in a consulting company, you know, you get someone that has the right amount of time to just apply to a project you're trying to solve. And so they have a strong software engineering team, which means they get kind of like the special software on top of that, but then they get to do all, all of the build outs and they don't have to hire out to do software engineering. So it works kind of very well and speaks to exactly what you were saying. Yeah, well, it also works out really well for the individual too. I mean, if you think of a singular person with a very unique and valuable skill set, they can, you know, they can spend 10 hours with one client doing something 10 hours with another client, 10 hours with another client, especially if it's in demand and everyone is better off because one, they're getting paid from multiple different sources. They're doing similar work that they're interested in and passionate about. And the consumers, the companies are getting a benefit as well because they get a specialist to work on this who's doing it at other companies and knows how to do it really well. So yeah. there's, there's this really unique value exchange for the companies, but also for the individual people. I, I just don't think people conceptualize how valuable um, creating a skill set and being able to deliver on it to multiple people is like, it's great to do that for one company, but if you can do that for yeah. multiple companies. It, like you, you have, you have a business, right? <laughs> like, like that, that's the crazy I, thing. I, exactly. I, one thing I wanted to add, which is a hundred percent in line with that is that interesting work itself is an attractor. There's, I joke sometimes that this work would do itself because people want to do it so badly because it's so interesting in certain cases. In other cases, it's a little bit more, it requires attention to detail and more time and kind of uh, less creative thinking. But the fact that we, we can offer these kind of like bundled projects and people can kind of pick and choose them, it's kind of like a, a very egalitarian uh, 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 process of the people with the best skills will get the project. But if people want to help out, there's always hours to go around. There's always things that need to be done. Somebody might be doing the ML model, or the optimization model, but there's some visualization work. There's some pipeline work that if people want to grow in a certain skill set, now we think about projects as like the blended hour. It's every single hour is a little flavor of the things that are needed. And as long as you kind of hit the estimates that you give at the beginning and you track that, uh, it's actually very possible to give everybody an interesting project. Um, and it makes it's it's very flexible working model too that people can uh, tap into or tap out of when they need to. So you, you touched on the model there a little bit. Can you break it down into more like, like simple simple terms for me? Like from 
ground zero, what is your guys' operational approach? If, if you're comfortable sharing this for, for allocating hours and, and, and giving people work that's, that's in line with their interests. I think that this is something that from an, like if I was to be an employer for you guys would be very interesting for me to understand. I also think it's probably a differentiator on your guys' end. The work that we take on is project-based and we try to keep every project in a kind of digestible morsel. So they're never really longer than 12 weeks. They're never really shorter than four weeks. The reason that we do that is because we like people to understand the end-to-end process and not just be a cog in the machine. So every we structure projects the way that uh, kind of MBB consulting firms do, where every individual owns a module and some responsibilities for the course of the project. And everybody meets internally together to talk about uh, what is being built along the way and any blockers and dependencies. And then we present it to the client when it's ready. The part of the projects that is kind of new to me um, and I'm learning more about is uh, the sales process because at BCG, it's a very much delivery focused model. Most people up to the principal level um, are, are mostly delivering projects that are already sold. And a lot of those projects are repeats. So when one client finishes a project, there might be another need around the business. So a team will lift out and then a new one will come in and start the new project. So we kind of have a similar model where we have clients that have repeat 10, 12, 15 projects with us at this point. And it's really exciting because we just have a really modular approach of delivering value in each project. So when they're paying a kind of consulting rates for just software and code at the end of the day and, and presentations and handholding along the way, they see the results in a live dashboard after we finish the project. So they actually see kind of, look, this, this investment is returning X amount every single week because it's an automated email in your inbox that tells you, are you on track? Are you above expectations? Or are you below? So we try to keep it transparent and uh, that's how we sell and deliver work. Mike knows a lot more about um, kind of how we figure out how to staff and crack problems that are really, really challenging. There's some things that clients hire us to do that we've never done before. So. But before we get into that, I'm interested in what you mentioned about getting repeat work. I mean, that's something that's been very compelling for me. I think a lot of people don't realize that most consulting comes from the, the easiest work to win is work that you already have with an existing client because they know what you've done. If you serve them well, it's really easy to, to upsell or to, to expand scope. Um, how do you guys approach getting new clients? That to me is something that um, is usually a little more difficult than it seems, or for some people, it just happens really naturally through through in-network or whatever it might be. Uh, but I'm interested in what your guys' journey has been with that. It's kind of this funny thing and that like, you know, when you're run a company or really just when you're part of a company that you are excited to be a part of, where you like the work, where you find it fun, you talk about it a lot. You know, like people ask you, what do you do? And you're like, oh, I run a data science consulting company. And then they like ask you questions. It just kind of goes from there. So in fact, like our lead investor, you know, I met him at my friend's wedding. Like he, um, I asked him what he did and he's like, oh, I run an insurance company. And I was like, oh, that sounds so cool. Like what kind? He's like flood insurance. I was like, oh, I was like, do you work with like hydrography data? You know, like, like river data. Do you work with like pluvial data, like flood data, like elevation data, all this modeling? He's like, you know, no, not yet, but we, we, we've been meeting to, we just, we don't have the resources to do it in that specific way. We want to apply more ML to it, but you know, we don't have any ML engineers. Like we have software engineers. And I'm like, Oh, well, I have some ideas, you know, what about doing it this way? And it was just a very organic conversation, where it's really just me nerding out with this guy, right? And the conversation is kind of flowing well, but like, if the topics align, and given how much companies need data science nowadays, it just evolves from there. Like, it's, so it's kind of this kind of natural piece, we haven't really done outbound marketing like we haven't like done cold calls because we've just worked with people in the past and there's a lot of kind of interest in what we're doing and the model we have and like how we can apply it it's also just it is a good time to be in data science because i think people are realizing that like data science is not this new fingle thing anymore it is a necessity to stay competitive 
You know, it's like back in the dot com uh, boom, having a website. Like companies like at one point it was newfangled, but then it's like if you don't have a website, you're not going to succeed as a company. Whatever the company was, retail doesn't matter. And so I feel like it it makes it a lot easier for people to just want to learn more about what we do, want to learn more about data science. And given Lean Demise, like vast kind of past experience working like in different industries and in different ways and with different tech, we can speak to a lot of it. Many people would be surprised at how many opportunities there are for data science projects or data work. I mean, just as you had mentioned, every single company likely has some data problem, whether they know it or not. And just being able to talk about the stuff you're doing, ask good questions about what other people are doing, what types of problems they have, any of these types of things, like you can find opportunities in the weirdest places, right? When I was in Chicago, one of the first like contract gigs I did, there was this company called Zcruit. And I was just really interested in their work because what they were doing was aggregating a ton of data on high school uh, football players. And they were just sending that or sharing that with colleges. And they have the data. I, I was just talked with the with the CEO. He's actually a good friend of mine now. And I, I got to know him and we eventually started talking. I was like, well, what do you do with this data? What are, what are the problems you're trying to solve? And I ended up doing uh, some contracting work to build some models for them to figure out based on uh, what, uh, like based on their Twitter data and a bunch of these other things, um, which of their schools that they had offered for offers from, uh, which they were most likely to commit to. Right. And it, you know, it just came organically out of me having some conversations with this guy because I was interested in what they were doing. I didn't plan to go in doing any work or any of these types of, of things. But if you talk to people about their problems and you happen to be the person that can also solve their problems, they'll probably work with you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Exactly. Yeah. You know, if, if you're, you're talking to the, to a guy about how your toilet's broken and they happen to be a plumber, right? Like it's th they're the, yeah, they're it's, the first person you know around it. Right. I, I, I think that that is a more genuine approach to generating business because it's comes from a two way exchange of value. Like we are a, a, a growing firm and we're looking for new clients to expand and companies that have a lot of uh, ex kind of existing budgets, but problems that they can't solve. Um, automatically are kind of on the search for each other. So in a way, we're kind of a, uh, I, I don't like this term, but Palantir uses it in some of their uh, investment prospectus documents that they're a labor arbitrage model, that they essentially find really interesting problems that can't be solved and they find people that can solve them. And by being able to match those two parties, it's actually kind of, uh, it's not risk-free work because there is the case sometimes if a project is not going well, we're not going to pass on the extra costs to a client unless it's a, a that kind of agreement. We oftentimes have to do the right work and we, we kind of some project, not every single project is profitable because we sometimes have to do the right thing to make the clients uh, kind of value the work and understand that they got value for what they paid for. But that kind of commitment exists with friends and with colleagues who've worked together before. It's a little bit harder via cold call to kind of get, get that guarantee of uh, that we'll do the right thing uh, when it comes down to it. Absolutely. I, I love that overarching message of, of doing the right thing. And I think that people really look at payoff too often in the short term. If you're doing the right thing, you're doing right by clients, that usually has a really long tail that actually gives you a better return on the time that you've invested. So if you're not thinking of things short-sightedly, I think that that's a pretty good business model, to be perfectly honest. Um, you know, something that I'm interested in just based on what you've already built is what do you see the future of this business being? I mean, maybe it's too premature. I mean, realistically, we're all data people and it's, you know, data people usually focus more on iteration and following what the market and these types of things do, but what would you like this to be and what what direction are, are things pulling you you know this is an interesting thing i think it's a evolved a little bit and i think that kind of harkens back to kind of the initial statement of like you know i never had the entrepreneurship bad gleam did um so i you know i i really like the work we do because i just love how interesting the problems are um 
I find them just to be like, you know, just just all feel like these cool logic problems. Except instead of someone coming up to you and be like, oh, here's like an interesting problem. I wonder if you can solve this riddle. They're like, and if you do solve it, you know, I'll pay you all this money. <laughs> like, it's kind of great. So it's just very, very fun. And so, you know, however we go, I want to kind of continue to do that. And I think as long as we hire great people, we can continue to do this. And so one decision we kind of made as we were growing is like, well, do you hire, you know, offshore people or people who are newer or people who you can pay less because maybe their skills aren't as mature and you have, you know, some grunt work to kind of hand off. And this is a common model, right? To offshore, to, 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 to outsource offshore a lot of what you do. And we kind of decided just not to do that. We decided we're really going to focus on the work that is like particularly challenging that needs really good people, which then allows us to hire really good people because then, you know, we can afford them if the work is hard and justifies those rates. And so I think however we grow, it's going to be key to stick to really challenging problems, many that, you know, aren't easily solvable or aren't even known to be solvable. Um, there's actually like some work we're doing now that uh, we're under like patent discussions over it just because it's the first time it's been solved in this way. Um, and I think that's a key tenant to how we grow. As for size and all that, I'm going to defer to Gleeb. And the reason um, is, you know, my background is in tech and I love enabling all of this. But, you know, Gleeb certainly has kind of a drive to grow this business. And so we grow it together, very complimentary. But I think he's got the vision here. I have a tech vision, but I'm going to give uh, pass off to him for the business vision. Yeah, I, I will say that check out our blog because we just wrote this yesterday. We published it. We've been writing it for months, but we just Good timing. published like our, <laughs> our founding principles. Thank you. Um, and kind of what we stand for, and people can hold us accountable to that in the future. And um, I think that the way that this market will change, to, the, to your question, is uh, it, LLMs are changing the way that entry-level work is being done across the entire corporate world. And if they're not yet, most companies will start to look into ways to do that. So really entry-level consulting where people are just writing SQL queries or doing very basic non-analytical work are going to be more difficult to find high-paying jobs that do that. Um, so what's not going away, though, is the apprenticeship model that is developed in consulting firms and in many other kind of industry jobs as well where a small group of experienced individuals sits and partners with young graduates who pass some complicated uh, selection process and are stellar in every way. And by pairing experienced minds who are very in demand to do kind of a variety of different things with younger graduates who are just building their, their career and their brand, um, that's, that's a model that I think works because that means that the likelihood of a project succeeding is greater because people have done it before. And it also builds pyramids and muscle memory of working together and delivering kind of a set framework, which can create a higher likelihood of project success and delivering results. So consulting as an industry, I think is a little bit uh, going to be disrupted, but hopefully uh, we're doing that. So. Yeah. You know, something I, I just thought of, and I really like about what you're building is that you've created a really good landscape to recruit high level talent. So something I've learned from speaking with a lot of data scientists is that one, they generally make a lot of money and money is not a major factor in their decisions outside a certain point. You know, you, if you make an extra beyond like a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, each incremental dollar is, is not that valuable to someone who already has doesn't make you happier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not continuous response care. Yeah. I, I mean, I've had so many, I probably had four or five friends that just quit their data science job because they weren't interested. The problems weren't challenging enough. They were doing a lot of the same things and you know, they'll probably work in data science again, but what they would love is just an exciting or challenging new problem more so than a, an additional paycheck. And you guys have, in some sense, not necessarily solve that problem, but you've pointed at it. It's like, hey, you can come work part time and work on really cool stuff and get, you know, a reasonable income 
I would imagine a lot of high level data scientists, machine learning engineers, whoever it might be, would be inclined to do that more than get another big tech job just because of the freedom, but also the intrigue of the projects. And, you know, it, it's, it's always interesting to me to see how people carve out their own spaces in the market. And I think you guys have done a really unique way uh, of doing that. I'm looking forward to seeing how, how that continues to grow on that front. Um, any, any thoughts on that or? Um... I, I do have one uh, uh, quick thought. I'll, I'll try to make it quick. It actually surprised me how true that was. Like, I guess I knew that general concept was true that, you know, data scientists and people at this level are driven by more than just money. And what surprised me is like a lot of the people that worked with us from the beginning, right? When we were smaller and we had like, you know, like a 50 hour project we needed to kind of farm out. There were a lot of people like in our network that worked full time jobs, like 40 hours a week at big companies, like, you know, Amazon, financial firms, Google, Facebook, or Meta. And we're like, oh, yeah, no, that sounds interesting. Yeah, I could probably do 10 hours a week. And I'm like, how do you have 10 hours a week? You have a full time job. They're like, yeah, yeah, but this is more interesting. I'm like, really? They're like, yeah, they're like, I don't know. Uh, I've always wanted, like, one, one person was like, I've always wanted to work with LMs, you know? I don't do it in my day job. I think it'd be super fun to learn way more about them. Sign me up. I'll do 10 hours a week. And he has been fantastic. And, like, this has been true with all those people because these are people who are really good at what they do but are just really passionate about, like, solving these complex problems. Like, other people are just like, yeah, you're doing linear programming. I did that once. I thought it was really cool. I would love to have an excuse to do it again. And they do, and they really have the time. And then, you know, eventually some of these people jump over. But what's just really interesting is how much, you know, people's kind of faces like light up when you're talking about these problems that like are just really fun and interesting. And you're like, oh, and we can pay you, you know, like it's not just you don't have to volunteer for this. I think at a lot of large companies, many people who are really good at their work fall into the curse of success, where if they're really good at one thing, they're asked to do that one thing over and over again, and they get better and better at it, but then they can't really diversify because they're so good at that one thing. And then you run into challenges where, you know, if you have an individual contributor who's so good at that one thing, and then they make them a manager and they're terrible at managing, you have problems like that. You know, most of the time though, you just have these people that are super sharp, super bright, but because they're so good at something, they've been pigeonholed into it. And that means that like just because they're good at it doesn't mean that they love to do it at us after a certain point and giving people the freedom to work on things that maybe aren't necessarily their core competency, but allows them that like stimulation to be able to get good at something else again, I think is really empowering for, for a lot of people in, in tech domains, because like, yes, it's nice to get paid a lot to do something you're good at, but it's not all that nice to do that if you don't really enjoy that. Uh, and it, it can it really can be a curse for a lot of people in that sense. So uh, very, very interesting dynamic that's created there. Mm -hmm. You know, bef before we go, I, I really am interested in kind of growing pains uh, of, of a company like this. So one thing that I, I'm particularly interested in, we talked in uh, about offline is, you know, like what what do you do when someone approaches you with a project that is a little bit ambiguous in terms of like ethics or it's just like in sort of a gray area because especially as a growing company you want to get new work you want to grow and you want to expand and some companies did that and made a ton of money you took a look at like cambridge analytica right like they, they made an absurd amount of money they were willing to take on a project and grow really quickly but because of that but it also kind of had disastrous long-term consequences um, and social consequences. Like how do you approach something like that? Has something like that happened before to you? Not probably at the scale of Cambridge Analytica, but but like, it's you know, what happens if you have things like it's that? It's a really good question. And it's something Gleeb and I, um, you know, chat about at, at length. Like uh, we actually started kind of forming like an internal like charter and mission statement for a company. You know, what are the guiding principles we really want to follow? And one of them was around this. Like, at what point do we just turn down a project and say, you know, it's not a good fit, like in scenarios like this. And I think I want to maybe give kind of uh, like an example. Um, 
so one thing that's common for companies is, is they do like, you know, kind of a marketing, like targeted marketing. Um, and you can imagine that uh, a makeup company might have lots of different shades of makeup. And this is actually an interesting thing. And it, it comes up a lot in different kind of companies where like if they're making a lot of shades of makeup and they want to target makeup to people who have specific skin tones, which certainly makes sense. That's who buys makeup of that shade. But the question is like, how do you do that in like a reasonable way, right? Because on the face, it sounds like a fine project, target people who are likely to buy this product. But as soon as you get into all the details of it, there are so many other complexities that make this a really complicated, kind of like hairy thing to do. And so usually in those scenarios, like when we're trying to, if we have to think to ourselves, like how do we make this work while walking this fine line, the answer is just not a great fit for us. You know, like we're just not gonna go down this road and do this project. We have the ability to just turn things down. Um, sometimes there is an easy fix for the project. Sometimes it's just twisting to say like, well, what do you really want? Can we just ask a totally different question um, and focus on something totally different? Like, you know, in that example, it might just be something as simple as like, okay, maybe you just want to do a partnership with other people that sell similar products and just have them co-market with you, right? Then you don't have to make these hairy decisions or figure it out. Just partner with people like people who buy this market shade also buy from this other company, just partner with another company. So sometimes there are ways to just completely sidestep um, any of concerns and work in a very like commendable way. But if you can't, you just you just shouldn't be involved with the project. I. I, Gleeve and I both actually use the same term, although we actually heard it in different areas, which is kind of interesting, which is like, would you feel comfortable in your project ending up on the front page of the New York Times? Like for all of the work we've done, the answer is just like kind of a clear yes. Like it'd be cool if the New York Times, you know, focused on our latest project. And our clients allowed us to publish it. Yeah. And our clients allowed us to publish it. Yes. But like, you know, if you have to, if you have doubts about that question, then I would say you should have doubts about whether or not to proceed on that project. Yeah, I, I think that that type of test is very valuable and it's pretty visceral. It's sort of like, is this pornography or not? You know, by seeing it, right? Like that's, it's, it's one of those that types quote, of things. By the way. Like, I think it was a congressman who said that, right? Yeah. You know, it, it's funny, even going down the route of some of those problems, you sort of just back yourself into a corner. So let's take the makeup shade example, right? It's like, oh, we're not going to, we're not going to do this based on race. Let's look at proxy factors. Probably the most correlated proxy factor would be like income or location of where you live. And then you're like, well, those aren't really good to, <laughs> to, to lump against either. And then, you, you know, you start going down for like things that are essentially like direct, uh, directly correlated to race or to gender or to some of these things. And you're like, uh, I probably didn't want to, <laughs> you know, like you, you, you just start working down this rabbit hole, which it usually doesn't have have great outcomes. And I love that you do, when you're working for yourself, have the power to not take on work, you have the power to fire clients, you have the, the power to control and shape your own destiny and your own your own sort of like ethical uh, circuitry within the organization. Um, and, you know, it, it obviously is difficult if you have big clients or a lot of money coming in that they could be asked to do something. But again, we talked about a long term tails and return on investment. And I think that making those decisions. And, and the truth is like sometimes trades. you'll get asked stuff like, and people won't know that's necessarily wrong. So sometimes like it's not, you can just be like, let's, let's alter the sidestep a little bit. And it reminds me of like, back when I was in college, they would teach you how to answer questions in an interview that like weren't allowed to be asked, right? Like somebody can't ask you like, how old are you? Or like, yeah, are you married? Woman, like, are you getting pregnant soon? Yeah. And so they, I remember like they went through this kind of thing, like how do you answer that? Like if somebody asks you like, let's say you're older and someone's asking how old you are because they're concerned you're gonna retire soon. Like, sure, you could say, oh, that's an illegal question. Don't ask me that. But you don't wanna create that rapport in this interview. The person might not even know they're not allowed to ask you. So instead, you just respond with something like, oh, you know, I intend to be here for a while. Like, this is not going to be a one to two year job for me. I'll be here a while because that might be what they actually want. And you just answer in a way that makes them happy without, you know, making them realize that they did something wrong. And so sometimes that happens, too, where clients just ask something that they shouldn't. And you just 
point out by pivoting to something that like is reasonable and is something worth kind of asking. Um, and so like, as long as you feel that is, you know, find to phone the front page of New York Times, and I would say that is a good litmus test. The way that people get to a solution doesn't necessarily have to be um, the only way to reach what they want. So, you know, the idea here is that, okay, this person actually wants this one thing. And the approach that they're taking is just one way to get to that same thing. You can propose something completely different that serves, that does the exact, that creates the exact same outcome for them. And those two things can be, the approaches can be dramatically different. And, you know, my, my question is, how do you get to some of those needs that are not articulated? Ask more questions about the problem. Sometimes, you know, a client comes in and goes, we want X. And you're like, okay, well, to get X, we need to do Y. But in reality, the client needs something slightly different or they didn't think to tell you some other detail because they didn't think it was relevant, right? And so probing more, you know, backing up a step to be like, okay, you're asking for this, but like, tell me what the overall problem is. Like, what are you trying to solve here? Because especially when you're the subject matter expert in something, they might not realize something else is possible, right? They might not realize that like, oh, if I want you to do exactly this, there's actually this much easier way to do it. Um, I think we were just talking the other day. Uh, this isn't specifically in kind of like, we were talking with the client about like how to reach out to people after like hurricanes um, and to, to, to advertise flood insurance to that area, right? Or after flooding events. And so one question was like, how do you get the area of like where a hurricane went? And what was funny is one client was like, they sent us like a photo from like, you know, the national forecasting. It's just like a photo of like the hurricane on top of a map. And I think they thought this would be like impossible to like find the error. Like, oh no, there are tools. You can just kind of trace it and then georeference it and just pull it out. So by backing, sorry, I might've gone down a bit. <laughs> Big query is great. <laughs> So, so in that scenario, right, I think they originally asked me like how, what, like they sent me a visual of a storm. This was actually in Vermont, a flooding event. And they said like, what are the zip codes affected by the storm? And, you know, zip codes are approximate and they're edges of the storm. And so I backed up for a second. I was like, wait, what do you actually want here? Do you want the zip codes? Like, why do you want the zip codes? And they're like, oh, well, we want to find the addresses of people to send mail to. I'm like, oh, so really you want the addresses of the people within that storm field. So not just kind of the zip codes that are approximate that might go far out, you want the addresses. And when you realize that that's what they want, you can offer a better solution. So you can say, okay, let me geo-reference and trace the storm um, and then get the latitude and longitude of the boundary and get all the addresses within it. No need to go to zip codes that were all the way out there because one corner touched. And so it's just finding out more of what they need is like, incredibly helpful in coming up with a better solution. Otherwise you might solve exactly what they're asking, but it's just not the best solution. And uh, this happens, you know, a lot across all clients. And it happens because, you know, remember they're hiring like experts to solve their problem. And so they might not even know how to properly ask it or how to properly think about it. That's something I see that separates what I would consider to be like a good employee or a good consultant from a great consultant is not just answering the mail, but meeting the underlying need, which I think are two very different things, like building exactly what someone wants and solving the problem that someone has are not the same thing. And you sort of have to dig deeper. You have to like elicit things. You often have to elicit things to solve the problem rather than just build a, uh, not necessarily a solution, but build, build something that that meets their requirements. Agreed. Absolutely. That's what we intend to be. We a trusted advisor that's around for the long term. And uh, that's how our clients see us. We work with CEOs, heads of marketing, directors of large business units. They know more about their business than we do, but we can partner and really scale up and create leverage for them to do things that they never thought that they could do. And sometimes it does, sometimes they think it'll take a hundred hours and it's only five. And we, we just, we are honest about how long it takes. So, um, because we, we believe that in the long term that will pay off because they'll be, be with us in times, uh, for 
for our future as well as we grow. Awesome. Well, those are all the questions I had. Let's let's sort of end on a fun note. I'm interested in what maybe the the craziest or most interesting project you've ever done is. I mean, honestly, that the uh, geo referencing the the storm sounded pretty freaking cool. Um, but I, I'd love to hear that. And then I would also love best way for people to reach out, learn more about you guys. Um, that would also be great. The craziest project I ever worked on was where I got to use sports data to predict demand for beer and food. So we were working with a a very large restaurant chain and by creating the competitive rankings of different sports teams, you can really see peaks in demand. So that was like that, like the first time in my life where I felt that this data that I'm looking at is actually a little footprint of the entire human society and that people follow trends. That if uh, two sports teams that are really good are playing, playing each other, there's a lot of interest and a lot of uh, if they both have very good records. But if one of them is very good record, another has a very bad one, demand is much lower, less sales. So it was really cool just to work, work with people who understood that uh, dynamic, but never were able to put it into action in their business and to empower them to make those decisions. I thought that was one of the coolest things I've worked on and craziest things. That would be very interesting to me based on the individual fan base. Like I think an externality of an analysis like that, you'd be able to see what fans are the most loyal, for example, uh, versus what fans are sort of fair weather based on if their team is good or, or not or, or anything along those lines. So uh, I, I love the idea that sports or some of these things can be proxies for a lot of other economic uh, activity. I like that one because it shows kind of a hidden insight. But I'm going to give you one that's a little bit different, which is just going to show kind of, I guess, the power of data and like when you actually have the right tool to solve a problem, how powerful it can be. So I have a friend who owns a ton of land in Colorado. And if you get your land certified as agricultural land, you can save like, you know, ten to fifty thousand dollars in taxes. It's tremendous, but it's kind of a complex process. And this person like had their land and they grew hay on it and they cut it and sold it. So it is a farm, but the requirements require you to prove that it is and to show how much acreage you have essentially like grown stuff on. And the person, it was just one person, they're like, I don't, like, how do I do that? How do I show how much I grew it on? Like, I didn't measure it. Like I could get a survey maybe, but I don't know how like expensive that would be. They'd have to walk like, you know, a hundred acres. And so they didn't know how to do this. And you know, um, using GIS, the problem is just like, like we do a lot of GIS work, but using GIS, the problem is just like super simple. There's actually this really cool website and uh, this, this isn't like, they certainly don't pay us, but I think it's so cool. It's called SkyFi. You can type in any address and they will take satellite photos of that address for you, like the next day. And so this person, you just like, it's like $100 or so for like the photo, but it's like next day. And so you can just, take photos of the like this person just took photos of their land right um you had them before when they had hay after they after they cleared the hay and then you just georeference it as a describer you just trace it and it's a number of acres and then they just submit it and they got agricultural status like the process like took like an hour <laughs> but like they otherwise had no idea how to even approach this right like who do you hire is it thousands or tens of thousands of dollars to get a certified plot plant to state this how do i know it grew and it's just like having the right tool for the job is just so incredibly powerful. And so it's like some of these projects end up being just so quick because the tooling out there is incredible and knowing how to use it properly and what you can do with it is like fantastic. Yeah, that website is fun. I did it. I took like satellite photos of like my house to look at essentially like, how does it look? Now I cut down a few trees and did some tree trimmings. Totally unnecessary use of the tool. A lot of fun. Well, I, I mean, to me, the other side of that is that's literally a business in and of itself. I mean, think about how many people have to evaluate what portion of their property is certain crops, um, even beyond having agriculture status for tax implications. I believe you have to uh, every farm has to disclose at least some of that information. So it's like, oh, yeah, you, you helped your friends with a project. But if you expand the scope of that you literally have a product that could be useful to to quite a few people, right? And it's like, oh, well, man, uh, 
started a company for for you know and if you're thinking about how much that normally would cost it's it's probably significantly cheaper you can also outreach to people right it's usually public record if something is registered as a farm you could reach out to every single plot of land i guess this is a business idea i'm just kind of floating out there on ether but you could reach out to every single person <laughs> that has enough land to qualify for ag status right then check if they do and if they haven't filed the paperwork you just tell them like and if it saves them like ten, twenty thousand dollars, and you know how much it saves them because tax records are public, you could just make that an entire business and just like reach out to people across the country. So like, small ideas can go big. Yeah. So if anyone does this, we want at least like <laughs> three or four percent cut. Um, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Amazing. Well, again, guys, this this was an awesome conversation. I I certainly learned a lot. I'm sure the listeners will as well. You have any? parting words of advice and also uh again the the best way for people to to learn more i'll be quick uh just don't don't fear the unknown invest in yourself take risks uh and i think it's a uh, it'll lead to less regret and happy and more happiness in the long run and if you ever want to reach us please go to uh charlesriverdata.com or feel free to find us on linkedin we also have an email address on our website uh, inquiries at charlesoverday.com and we'd be happy to learn about any of your interesting data questions. Amazing. Spoken like someone who just left their job to pursue an entrepreneurial <laughs> endeavor. <laughs> it's true. I, my parting words are do something you're passionate about, right? And that can change over time. So when I first started, I was actually a software engineer at Google. That was fantastic. Eventually, I really started to just grow my penchant for data and moved into data science and became a lot happier in that process. Um, you know, thankfully, I was easy to do at Google and I'm happy at COD now because I'm following my passion. I love these problems. I love diving deep into them and I love having excuses to learn all the latest and greatest in tools. So follow your passion. Sometimes it takes some time to find out what that passion is, to be honest, but, you know, keep looking for it. Um, reaching out. I think this all sounds great. You know, our website, our LinkedIn's, um, we just started our blog on Medium, uh, Charles River Data on Medium, um, and we're going to start posting essentially some fun analyses there. So I think coming up, we have essentially like looking at the different densities, like people densities of all the blocks in Manhattan to try to understand visually like what are the densest blocks and, you know, how does that determine like what kind of grows there in terms of like bars and restaurants and all that. I love questions like this. Well, I will leave the links to, to all of your guys stuff in the description and in the show notes on Spotify and Apple. So uh, for anyone listening, you can check out and learn more from Glebe and Mike there again, both of you guys. Thank you so much. I, I super enjoyed this conversation. As did we. It's always a pleasure, Ken. Thank you so much.